I'm Fred Miller uh, from P, uh, working with PwC, and I am uh, the subject matter expert on anti-corruption. And I have the great pleasure of working with a, a fine international panel today to discuss one of the aspects of uh, corruption and anti-money laundering that, that troubles all of us uh, when we deal in this particular world. And that is obviously the, the challenge and uh, the, the issue of shell companies. Uh, you know, what do they bring to the table? Are, you know, are they part of schemes uh, throughout the world, et cetera? And so in that regard, uh, we're gonna have some uh, good interplay uh, uh, among our panelists. Uh, I'd like to introduce them right now. Uh, we have with us today, and they'll uh, wave to show who they are. But uh, number one is Michelle Magri, uh, who hails from uh, Milan, Italy. He is the, uh, uh, like myself, a CFE, uh, and also the country manager for Michael Sims in International Investigations, and has conducted numerous uh, in internal and external international forensic investigations and advised clients in the AML fraud monitoring area. We have also with us Ralph Banks. Ralph is the CEO of Recomply, uh, a consulting firm which specializes in embedding compliance into companies' operations, and he has previously held positions in uh, of senior uh, type in the internal audit world with international companies. Uh, we also have with us Carl Sheps. Carl is uh, a partner and a managing director of Infina Security SRO in the, from the Czech Republic, and he has assisted numerous com companies and clients in financial investigations of numerous AML, CFT, and KYC topics. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Mary Gentile. She is the, currently uh, the professor of practice at the, the uh, very famous Darden School of uh, the University of Virginia. And she's the author of Giving Voice to Values, How to Speak Your Mind When You Know, you're, know, know What's Right and has consulted with uh, senior management level people throughout the world and uh, is gonna bring a, a very interesting and fresh perspective to how to deal with this problem from a senior leadership standpoint. So I think with that, I'd like to do just a quick little, um, uh, kind of should say with a segue and then get into questions for our panelists. And uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to hear from the audience later on. So uh, as you get questions, please use the chat. Uh, methodology there, and then we'll work from there. But at least in my own experience, and I do a lot of uh, work uh, with clients who deal with with this this issue of anti uh, money laundering and, and 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 you know corruption throughout the world. And one of the toughest aspects of doing that, uh, typically, is in the KYC area, is how do you deal with shell companies? Okay. Who are they? Who's really behind them? How do you get behind them? How do you get comfort? Uh, because, you know, we live in a world where there's lots of things going on and, and lots of times, you know, the company's programs are focused on, uh, you know, how to identify the, the bad people from the good people in the world. And, uh, you know, with, with the constantly uh, up, upswing in enforcement activities by very many governments, uh, that's always a challenge. The rules are changing, the people are changing, the risks are changing. And so from that standpoint, uh, being able to really understand who you're dealing with uh, from a third party standpoint, partic but particularly in the area of shell companies, is a real challenge. And, you know, sometimes you worry you have to play the, the whack-a-mole game. You know, you close them down here, or you identify a bad person here, but next week they're, uh, you know, in another country with another another name. So obviously, you know, what we are seeing is that multiple governments uh, are, uh, in the world are trying to improve transparency and allow for enhanced KYC for, uh, from companies to be able to identify and, and so we, shall we say, separate the wheat from the chaff out there in terms of who the good people are to deal with and who the, the bad people are to not deal with. Uh, I personally practice uh, in Canada and the U.S. both, and uh, in our anti-corruption world, particularly you know the ABC AML uh, sanctions world, uh, there have been a, no, a, a number of pretty serious uh, changes for the better, I would say, uh, by U.S. government regulators and Canadian regulators recently to increase that transparency around you know such entities and shell companies and you know creating for example the Canadian government is going to create a public uh, registry or is that devoted budgetary money in the federal budget to, to create that and um, 
also the U.S. government has has passed some some new rules and really kind of a first big update to what what they've been doing in AML in, in a number of years. And and again, the focus is on well that while that registry won't be public, it'll be run by FinCEN. Uh, it is it is something that is uh, you know certainly going to be available for people uh, and the government to be able to check on. So as is probably well known. Uh, we struggle in Canada with the uh, phenomenon of snow washing, where AML is said to, uh, by different studies, uh, be a, anywhere from a 46 billion to 100 billion Canadian uh, uh, problem each year. And one of the, the real keys behind the push to, uh, by the Canadian government to uh, improve its transparency and, tran uh, and, and and knowledge of who's really setting up these companies is the fact that there's this real big issue and it has all sorts of knock-on effects, societal effects, you know, cost of real estate in certain cities and things like that. So I guess one first quick round robin to, to everyone is what do you think of these new uh, rules and, and improvement of transparency? Do Are they working or can they work? And Michelle, I'll go to you first for that one. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, good morning or good evening, everybody. Uh, it's very, very interesting this uh, conference because uh, we try to uh, put some uh, important uh, uh, topics about uh, shell company. Uh, based on my experience of my company, is an um, investigation company. Uh, one of the first questions that I have to to, to provide an answer is what are the difference between shell corporation and illegal corporation? Everybody say what could be shell corporation or illegal corporation, but uh, in my ballot point, I put some very clear uh, aspect of this uh, difference be between uh, these two kind of company. For example, the shell company uh, in our experience is the shell corporation could be created online for example, with a credit card and uh, email address. It's very easy, you know, it's been uh, a few minutes and you are able to uh, perform some uh, business uh, without any other uh, support from anyone. Again, uh, Shell Corporation, uh, for example, are based in the tax haven. Okay, there are many of these tax haven around the world. Uh, if you go inside the internet, you can, select your best and suitable uh, and comfortable um, shell company and for this point of view of course it's very very easy in general our uh, tax exempt uh, this uh, corporation and uh, the people that would uh, uh, use this company for illegal purpose uh, get this uh, this kind of structure another very important point is the that the shell corporation could be legal or illegal depending on their activity you know, uh, based on our experience, is not always illegal or always legal. Of course, in in uh, in our experience, uh, are illegal uh, corporation because, for example, uh, many people that would uh, um, wash money that come from illegal activity, for example, drug or terrorism, etc., use this kind of company. But in other cases, it's not so. Uh, so explicit uh, this kind of uh, corporation. On the other hand, if you would like to uh, understand uh, uh, the opposite of uh, shell company or shell corporation, is the uh, is the company that are infiltrated or legitimated in uh, get business in the real world. What, uh, for example. Uh, illegal corporation are companies that already exist. The difference between the shell corporation and this company are uh, existing, for example. In uh, our experience in Italy, for example, or in Europe, there are many, many companies that are illegal, but are, let me say, created or incorporated by a legal procedure. You know? Another point is the legal corporation are based uh, for example, in the area near us, for example, in Milan, in Rome, in uh, Munich, or in other uh, European cities, okay, and work uh, perform their business in the real economy. Okay, another point that is uh, in uh, our ballot point before starting investigation is uh, 
the illegal corporation use capital money from illegal activity to wash it. Okay. As for the shell corporation, the illegal corporation use the same schema. Okay. And from this point of view, of course, it's very, very um, tricky to understand which are uh, legal or not legal. Another okay. very important, yeah. I was going to go to Carl. Carl, you've been doing a lot of work in financial services for 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 you know many years. And, and what are you seeing in terms of the use of shell companies? How do they use them? You know, and, and you know, is there a change? Do you see differences between regions of the world or countries in the world? Carl, is for me the question, Frederick. Uh, I think Carl is on mute. Okay. He's talking away, but we have no sound. Carl, are you there? I think we've lost Tim. Carl, can we hear you? Okay, great. Now we hear you. We, we, we could see you talking, but we could not hear you. So if you could talk a little bit louder would be great. Uh, did you hear my question? Yes, I hear your question. Good. I simply have problem with the microphone. Ah. Okay. I will switch the microphone. <clears throat> Sorry for the technical difficulty, people. Can you hear me now? Yes, better, much better. Okay, but I can't. Okay, now I hear you and I can hear you. Okay, Excellent. good, good, thank you. Sorry. Okay, so to re reposition the yes. question, it was. Uh, the question you know, was. Uh, since you have a lot of experience in dealing with financial services, what are you seeing in terms of shell companies in your practice? And you know, has the, the pattern changed? And are there differences among and between regions or countries that you're saying? Uh, you know, uh, I mainly was working with uh, small, medium-sized companies and, and retail clients. So we have always to divide between the big one, those one they have, let's say, the the power to establish a framework of shell companies. And uh, these are, let's say, from the from the amount of, of money, they are definitely the bigger one, but uh, we have a lot of uh, smaller clients. Uh, they have mm -hmm. the same intention, but they don't have so much possibilities. So the, the usage of uh, shell companies in the small, medium-sized companies are really went back because it's a lot of, let's say, problems connected with that. First of all, you have additional costs to take because uh, normally the shell company is not in the neighbor country, so you have to go somewhere to establish a company. Uh, then you have to, to hand over the control of the company to someone else you don't know, and you have no control to this uh, anymore because um, if this guy is not... Uh, straightforward, a good one. So he easily can, let's say, move your money somewhere and you have no chance uh, to get it back because legal ways are restricted. So you cannot ask for let's say, legal help from your own country to the other country because then they immediately know that you have a, a shell company. So this is definitely one, one Big thing, one big issue why smaller companies uh, not use this at, uh, uh, as much as they probably would like to use it. Uh, then you have a, a different jurisdiction. So when you think about opening a shell company somewhere in the PBI or other, other areas, so a different legal system, a different legal understanding 
uh, and um, again, you get lost in this in this area if you're not a lawyer from from this uh, from this country. So you need to have definitely someone who to, to trust and who can help you. And uh, the third thing is now let's say the differentiation be between uh, let, let's say the legal use and the, the other use. So if you have a, a legal shell company, uh, I don't know really why you someone should have one, but probably there's some reason. But uh, if you have a legal one and, and you have to declare something to the tax and you go to, to, uh, to the officer in the, in the finance office and say, yeah, I have, I have some uh, um, shell company on the BVI, so he, he, would, uh, become, uh, he will become great eyes and he will not believe you that you have only one of them. So, so then you immediately, let's say, under the investigation of the finance office and uh, there is no way out. So uh, there are several restrictions why not to have it as a small company. And of course, there are the same reasons as a big company or a big uh, or someone who has a lot of money, let's say, let's call it like this, uh, is the same reason why not to have it. Yeah? Because you are definitely on, on the side of the crime. And uh, the newest, um, money laundering directive from the European Union uh, was quite straightforward in defining uh, and aligning uh, European-wide the, the pre-decade offenses, they lead to, um, to money laundering. So right. of course, when, you, when we hear about money laundering, then in the first case, we think about uh, yeah, terrorism, drugs, prostitution, dealing with people. So these are, let's say, the, the, the mindset what we have. But the real world is a little bit different because we have a lot of uh, other pre-decade um, offenses behind. So robbery is from smuggling, uh, piracy, uh, and uh, also now new in the, in the European regulation is environmental crime. And the second one is cybercrime. So cybercrime and environmental crime can lead to uh, can lead to to money laundering. So uh, the other point is that the the punishment increases a lot. So until before before this reg regulation, it was up to one year of prison. Now it's up to four years. Uh, the fine goes up to up to one million, I think, or even more. Uh, besides the penalties, what you get, yeah. and also new is that not only individuals can be punished for it, also companies can be punished for it. So if you, as a company, uh, do not prevent uh, your employees from supporting uh, money laundering, so it ends up that the company can be stopped by law and even can be, let's say, closed by law. So right. there, the, the way, let's say, is clear from, from the regulations or from the law, people still try to avoid the taxes, which is 70% of, let's say, money laundering. Only 30% comes out from crime. 70% is uh, from, from tax evasion and uh, this is, let's say, the main reason why people try to launder money, not the crime, or let's say not the previous mentioned crime like, like terrorism yeah. and so on. Nobody wants to pay the tax, man. <laughs> anyway, I, yeah, I'm going to move over to Ralph now to get his perspective. Uh, especially, Ralph, what I'd like to kind of pick your brain about is what, what do you think in an internal audit role, since you've got a lot of experience in that area, what do internal auditors, or what can they do, or what should they be doing in this particular area, given your experience? Um, I think internal audits should, should play a key role in, in of course, making sure that uh, whatever's got set up actually um, have a uh, completeness in it and covering the, the, the main risk uh, that the company are facing. Um, 
we do have a, a a lot of different aspects that need to be looked at, especially to pick up and, and understanding if we are hitting shell companies or having them as, as uh, customers. But there's also a lot of other perspectives in, in looking at that. Um, in Denmark, we have been uh, blessed by the uh, uh, case about Danske Bank, which is a pretty big one. And they had a lot of good AML capabilities and capacity. They just didn't have integrated the Estonian um, branch. In, exactly. in the centralized system. So that was just running next to it. Um, that internal order might have picked up a bit late um, and understanding the, the complexity and the organization set up. Um, and, and that is something that I would look for internal audit. I wouldn't look for internal audit to be the expert in in all the, the different rules and then all the, the different pieces, but, but looking at how robust is the setup how complete we are, and how does that fit into the employee's daily life? Um, and understanding how can the employees actually deliver on all these rules uh, is also something that internal audit can do very well, um, and thereby having that organizational role to it. Right. Well, uh, you, interesting that you bring up the DOS ba bank case because uh, you know in, in uh, that particular matter internal audit also had an issue where they were trying to report what was going on and you know some of the people senior most at the bank were not exactly listening to the reports of the internal audit as to what the dangers or the or the risks were and and you know there there at least there are allegations that this had been going on for years and people hadn't been really paying attention to what was going on in in that particular part of the world uh, even though it was producing record uh, amount of re rec uh, revenue and profits for the bank you would think that they they might say well how come this Estonia branch is doing so well? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and that's when coming back to, to success and, and really understanding why do we have success? Um, and then looking at that and, and some of the other things that came out was actually that um, some of the report coming from the Estonian authorities uh, were not translated. So HQ, the headquarter, didn't actually know what was in there. They were relying on information provided by the by local management. And right. when they finally understood that, did they take really consequences? No, that took a very long time. Um, exactly. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. It helps if you know the local language, right? <laughs> exactly. But but looking at a number of global companies, they do have that challenge. And I think I we probably all have come across that there's a local management that is making it their own kingdom and and keeping headquarter functions on a pretty far distance, um, yeah, making right. it very difficult to look into what's actually there. And their internal audit need to be uh, tough and thorough on getting through. Right. I, I did a, a number of matters in, in uh, the People's Republic of China. And uh, when I was doing one of those matters, I, uh, someone said to me something that I have never forgotten, and that is, Mr. Miller, you're going to get on a plane someday and go home, but I have to live here. And remember, the mountains are tall and the emperor is far away. Exactly. <laughs> you know, they didn't really care what was going on uh, from the manager uh, sitting in Zurich or in, in, in uh, you know, uh, Toronto. What they were really worried about is the boss who sits who sits in their local country who can tell them what to do and you know, take away their livelihood and their family's livelihood. So I, I think sometimes that's that's definitely a, a challenge. Uh, P Professor Gentile, I, I know that you know you're going to you know give us a, a, a little bit uh, of a presentation uh, in a few minutes on on uh, on your 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 methodology. But before we get to that, uh, you give a lot of uh, advice to senior leadership. Uh, you know, hearing what you've heard, what's what's kind of your uh, sense on on how we could improve uh you know especially based you know what uh, on the down space bank case what is it that people can do from a senior leadership to address this shell company issue right well so um as you pointed out my work is actually on on leadership development so it's not really on anti-money laundering and shell companies but it's fascinating to hear um the examples from michelle and carl and ralph and i've certainly talked about these issues with executives that i've worked with and there's a lot of things going on. And we heard a little bit about it just now from, from Ralph when he was talking about um, internal audit and also the, the pressures, positive and negative, on internal employees. 
Um, and, but I think what we're learning from research is that there are lots of reasons why people behave in these ways, why people would engage in, in, in these kinds of practices. And, and it's not just because of the obvious reason that you know, it can be lucrative if you don't get caught. Um, it's also because of all the sort of psychological and organizational and group pressures that um, exist on individuals. Uh, folks who study social psychology and behavioral ethics and behavioral economics will, will point out to some of these pressures. And there's somewhat dip, there's some that overlap, whether you're very uh, junior in the organization or in the middle, and there's some that um, are more distinctive for folks who are at senior levels in the organizations. Um, one of the things that we do in the work that, that I'm involved with is that we identify what we call the reasons and rationalizations, the kinds of pressures that people um, encounter. And a lot of it has to do with how issues are framed. And one of the two of the ones that I think I'm hearing in the kinds of examples that my panelists, uh, colleagues here are raising are issues of what I would frame as loyalty, um, meaning loyalty to your tier of, of managers, whether you're in the middle, whether you're at the senior level, loyalty to your organization. And the other is, so that's kind of an, a, a tension that people will often feel. Another is uh, it's standard operating procedure. There's an assumption that this is in fact how it works in this organization or this industry or this part of the world, uh, given the examples you were just talking about, um, um, Frederick. Um, and so one of the things that we do in the work that we're involved with is that we normalize a conversation about those things. We actually name that dynamic because it all, uh, often operates at a, at a kind of automatic or unconscious level. Um, and then we actually engage people in a conversation to practice ways to reframe the situation. So we don't really, uh, just preach at people. <laughs> um, that's never, that's you know often very. Word. That's often ineffective. <laughs> it's often very often ineffective. Even when people want to obey the rules, even if they sincerely feel they would like to, preaching at them, we call it the preach and pretend method. You preach, you preach about what's right, and then you pretend people can do it. Um, we don't find that to be that effective. And so, in fact, what we actually do is we actually normalize the conversation, engage people in. Um, we, we call it the giving voice to values thought experiment in a, in, a, in a reframing of the situation. We don't ask you, what would you do? We ask you, what if you wanted to do X? So in other words, in this case, what if you wanted to operate in a different way, in a way that was consistent with the, with the existing laws or the new laws that are coming down the path, uh, pack or the regulations, et cetera. Um, and we get people engaged in that problem framing conversation. Um, and it's different when you're operating at a senior level, because then really what you're trying to do is maintain a collegial trusting relationship with your peers. It's different if you're speaking up in the organization. Some of the folks that Ralph was talking about, if you're trying to talk to someone more senior who you don't think will be receptive, you're going to have to use different tactics there. Um, and it's different if you're talking to your peers at a lower level who feel like you may be putting them at risk. Um, but there's different strategies that we've identified. I can talk about that a little bit later. But really what okay. we do is we try and practice this internal reframing and conversation within the organization. Um, and um, there's some research that suggests that this is actually a more effective way of getting people to behave differently than simply educating them about the rules. Not that that's not important. It's just not enough. I understand completely. Michelle, I'm going to go back to you for the next one. And that's, uh, you know, given what you do and, and, and how you've worked, what uh, have you seen as being, you know, the, I'll call them better practices or best practices about investigating these shell companies? I mean, what do you do that works and, you know, what are some of the challenges uh, when, when it doesn't work? On mute again. Michelle, you're on mute. Sorry, here you are. Thank you for the question. It's very, it's very interesting your question because uh, in based on our experience, uh, fundamentally we have two kinds of uh, investigation methodology. The first one is the traditional investigation. You know, but, uh, always use this kind of investigation that requires static and dynamic observation, for example, that could be based on the analysis of all the documentation inherent to the company. 
the shared component, of course, all the related companies that work and uh, develop business with the shared company. The second point or the second methodology methodology is the open source intelligence investigation. It's not a new uh, methodology because it's used from the military services, but uh, this kind of investigation uh, are always uh, use, useful for uh, acquire data, acquire information about the company. For example, um, it's possible to track the, 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 the computer uh, about the internet, you know, is uh, very useful to register office in tax haven because it's possible to get this information. Um, or um, if, we, if we have a lack of operational activity, we can build a new information, can build the investigation through the open source intelligence. Um, the, the, the big uh, challenge is uh, always to uh, to access to the company register. You know, the, 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 because the competent chamber of commerce, for example, is not easy to contact, and in some cases, not is not possible to have uh, information related to the company. And uh, for this uh, purpose, it is better to use, uh, let me say, an uh, investigation strategy based of on uh, OSINT uh, techniques. Uh, in our experience, both uh, the methodology are to be used for this kind of uh, investigation. It's not easy. The, the first one, the traditional investigation, in general, is very time consuming. You know, you have to, to go in the, in the place which the company are built and are incorporated, and then you can analyze. The other one is a little more easy, but uh, let me say, you have to, to know very well the strategy of, of SINT, uh, open source intelligence uh, methodology. Okay, great. Carl, next one is for you. And uh, kind of one of the things we tossed around is the fact that governments are trying to do a lot of things in this particular area. But I, I guess the question I'm gonna pose to you is, uh, are we winning the battle uh, against money laundering or not? And you know, our governments are spending a lot of money trying and, and companies are spending a lot of money to try and improve this problem, you know, is the money being wisely spent? Uh, could it be spent better, et cetera? Mm, I, I think that we will lose the battle. I will tell you why. Uh, you definitely know the, the Stockholm syndrome. And uh, when we think about people like uh, you and me, so normal working people, uh, so what we try is to keep our money, so not to spend it. And then we have the problem that we have to spend some money and we have also to pay some taxes. On the other side, we see the, the usage of the tax. And uh, so back to the thinking of the normal people, uh, in a lot of situations, we do not understand and we do not accept the usage of the tax. So I have to pay something which is not spent wisely. And uh, this is the normal way which keeps the or brings the normal people to the situation that they understand that another one also wants to keep his money into his own pocket and not to put it somewhere. So uh, that, uh, yeah, due to this understanding, he feels in the same situation, and this is why I call it uh, the Stockholm syndrome. Uh, Understand. The problem is simply that uh, we are really fighting against the older people, all the, 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 the yeah, people, and uh, that the state is now using, or the government is now using two different ways how to how to be successful. The one way is he transferred this responsibility of doing investigation, as Michel said, uh, to the to the business people. So you, as the lawyer, as the tax advisor, or someone who is dealing with property, or even let's say the normal commercial um, person doing business, a dealer for a kitchen, for example. So he is responsible for investigate, investigating his client. So he has to, to think about, okay, who is my client, from where he can have the money, 
uh, how to prove from where is the money. And the other side is now, so if you don't do it, or let's say the other way, if you do it yeah, in the proper way, the client kicks him out because he go to the next one. Uh, think about you go to buy a kitchen uh, and then the, the dealer start to ask you, okay, so where you, where you are employed, from where you have the money, uh, what you're doing, do you have shell companies, yeah? do you betray the state and so on. Yeah? But definitely not in this straightforward question, but somehow like this. So uh, you do, will not understand the reason why he's asking it and you will leave, leave the company. So the dealer has no business. Therefore, he tried to reduce his investigation as much as possible. The other side, if he don't do this investigation, he uh, risks the penalty because the, 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 the law says you should have known it. So you have to care about, you should have known it. And if you don't take care about, you have penalty and uh, it will end sometimes in the prison. So these are the two ways how to how the governance are going. One side, they are moving the responsibility to the to the to the economy, and second, if the economy is not doing what they want, they punish them. And I found an interesting uh, comment from a German lawyer. He was one of the former judge in a in a, in a let's say in the second or primary court. And he said, the vision of their addiction is far from reality. By definition, money laundering is the consequence of all asset-based crime. Its addiction would require either the end of crime or the elevation of money. And this is the way what I see now. Uh, money or the free flow of money, especially cash money is reduced dramatically. So you're not allowed, I think in Italy, you're not allowed to pay more than 1,000 euro in cash. In Germany, they are still, let's say, up to 10,000 euro. If you have more than 10,000 euro in your pocket, so you have to declare from where you have to. Pay. So uh, on the one side, I repeat this, what I said on the beginning, the state will lose the battle. On the other side, he will win because he has the power. Okay, so it's... Uh... A draw, I, you know, a, a nil-nil tie. <laughs> uh, I wanted to go next to, to to Ralph and say, you know, given again your your vast experience in this, how do you think that uh, you know companies are best placed to determine who the true beneficial owners are, and and you know what happens you know when you run into that blank wall of the anonymous uh, entity or the you know the brass plate entity uh, you know in zug or you know wh wherever it might be you probably have the cases uh, at some point of time that that you hit the wall uh, on on who is actually behind um and who's actually acting um and and in some cases you you probably have employees that, that take a, a step before and, and stop and saying, okay, I've got enough. My guidance and, and my policies, etc. said I should go uh, this far and uh, I'm home safe now. It's it's good. Um, I've covered my, my base and uh, leave it be, uh, even though they might have this suspicion. Um, and, and if we look at, at the reporting going into the authorities, yes, we have a lot in the financial institutions delivering a lot of those uh, reporting in. But if you look at uh, real estate, if you look at some of the other places who's also required to do, um, there's extreme low uh, number of reporting coming in. And then basically I think that's to some extent because people say, okay, I got enough uh, information. What should we do about it? Uh, one thing is of course that people need to know Okay, even if you are now, you need to raise the flag on this and then have specialized people coming in and look into it because we can't expect the front people, the guy in the uh, kitchen um, company, as, as Carl mentioned before, to go that additional length to, to do it. This is where we still need to have our compliance functions adding on. Um, then on top of that, we probably need to start building a more holistic picture about uh, the, the clients we have, 
uh, especially those that we look at and say these are risky. Um, do we have additional information that can help us create a full picture? Uh, we had some dialogue with, with some of the uh, authorities about also creating this kind of, of picture, drawing on, on some of the, uh, not only the, the financial information, but also other kind of information to, to create a more holistic picture and really understanding not only transactions and, and what's going on there, but also a lot of the other information that might be picked up. Uh, and I think we need to, to start at those that are really coming out as risky. Um, we need to take that additional step. Right. I mean, there's it, kind of a fine line that people walk sometime between, hey, I can make a lot of money on this client, but I'm not really sure and I'm not really comfortable. Is, you know, is this company who they say they are and what is the source of their income? Is it really what they say, say it is? And, and that brings up the age old question of, well, how far do you have to go? And do I adopt a check the box mentality in compliance? Or do I say I'm empowering my people that if they really have a gut feel that there's something wrong to do more? Exactly. And, and we also need to, to accept that the criminals get more and more sophisticated. Absolutely. Uh, if, if we look into cybercrime, you can have hacker attacks as a service. There's a terms and conditions related to that. Uh, they're just, in most cases, saying you're not allowed to uh, go and hack um, or health uh, uh, hospitals, etc. But And so they do have some values related to that, but it's a service. You can purchase it. And, and we should also expect to see that in other crime areas um, that we uh, have more sophisticated solutions coming from the criminal part of it. Yeah, interestingly enough, you know, the, the, the best protection from hackers might be a hacker, right? <laughs> exactly. Wait, that hacker. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Gentile, this might be a good time for you to kind of uh, pro, uh, you know, being, you know, given the way the, the flow of the conversation has been. How about telling us about your your methodology and giving us a few minutes on that because I, I think it's it's very valuable perspective obviously and something that you know in, in talking with senior executives and even middle level executives could be very helpful to them in in looking at this particular issue. Sure, I'd be happy to. So the work I do is called giving voice to values or GVV, um, and it grew frankly out of my disillusionment and despair. <laughs> from having some conversation on that note, some of the, on that some of the, yeah some of the kinds of things we've been hearing you know uh carl saying i think we're losing you know and and some of that and those are all true right i mean those are all real pressures that people are under and and you know my fellow panelists are describing a reality here so um so it grew out of my frustration and and as i said earlier working i was working at harvard business school at the time now i'm at university of virginia darden business school and and i was also you know would go out and speak to companies and you know it just seemed like what we were doing was make work it seemed you know futile at best and hypocritical at worst um just checking boxes in terms of telling people what the rules were and then pretending they could do them um so i gave up <laughs> a number of years ago and started working in other areas um but then i started to come across a number of things uh some really positive examples of folks uh, in India working on anti-corruption, um, in, uh, uh, in, in Nigeria uh, working on uh, some issues addressing some of the public sector pressures that were um, uh, environmentally dangerous, in China um, trying to figure out a way to get around some of the pressures from the central government in order to um, encourage some more environmentally um, um, uh, sustainable practices and a number of other examples. And so I was coming across real world examples. I was also coming across research that suggested that um, we really needed to think about these issues in a different way. Um, there's research from social psychology, from cognitive neurosciences um, that all suggest that if you want to have an impact on people's behavior, rather than asking them to think their way into a different way of acting, this is, uh, I'm, I'm quoting or paraphrasing from some scholars who study what's called positive deviance. Um, they say, rather than asking people to think their way into a different way of acting, it's more effective, more impactful to have them act their way into a different way of thinking. 
Um, the way I like to describe it comes from uh, the field of kinesthetics or study of physical movement. That if you're really, you know, teaching somebody self-defense or you're teaching somebody to play a particular sport, you have them rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. So when they're there in the tournament situation or under the pressure of being attacked, even though they freeze, you know, psychologically that that their body remembers. There's a moral right. muscle, there's a muscle, muscle memory. memory, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so giving voice to values was based on the idea of trying to create a moral muscle memory. So what we literally do is we create real life scenarios um, and we engage people in what we call the giving voice to values thought experiment. So we don't ever ask people, what would you do? Because if we ask you, what would you do? All of the, um, the psychological um, unconscious automatic responses that we know about from research kick in and we, we react emotionally and then we justify after the fact why it was the only thing we could do. Um, one of my colleagues at Harvard called these the professional rationalizations. I actually heard a few of them this morning uh, or today with, with some of my peers. Um, and so we don't ask that. Uh, instead, we ask, what if you wanted to do X? And we give them the, the legal or the ethical or the responsible action, whatever we're talking about. And we ask them to, to literally script an action plan and rehearse with their peers and peer coach we know from the research, people are more innovative and creative when they're not under pressure. So we give them these opportunities. We're not asking you, what would you do? What we're literally trying to do is to rewire that connection so that when I encounter the pressure to do something, my automatic response is more fulsome because I have more options in mind for how I might respond to the situation because I've looked at other examples and I've literally pre-scripted and rehearsed them with my peers. This is based on, on some research I could tell you about. We don't have time today. Um, and, and I guess the, the last thing I'll say about it is that, so it's a, it's a different approach to values-driven leadership development. It's literally being used now all over the world, not just in business schools, but in companies. We've, we've piloted it on all seven continents, um, believe it or not. Um, and it's also starting to be used in other contexts, legal contexts, engineering, uh, healthcare, et cetera. Um, but what I tell people is that it's, it, it changes our assumption about who it is we're talking to. Um, so it used to be I would go into a classroom or an organization and people would say, you know, most of the people here are good people. We've just got a few bad apples and they're the ones that we're trying to work with. I actually think of this differently. It's based on some research by Greg Dees and Peter Crampton. We think of the organization as a bell curve. And at one tail end of the bell curve are the folks who would self-identify as opportunists. These are the people who would say, I will always act uh, in a way to maximize my material self-interest regardless of values. Now, no one falls into one of these categories all the time, but these are people who say, that's my primary motivation. And at the other tail end of the bell curve are the folks who would self-identify as idealists. These are the ones who would say, well, I would always try and you know, act ethically after my values regardless of the impact on my self-interest. What, what, what we premise is that the majority of us fall under the bell and we call them pragmatists. I put myself there and we define pragmatists as people who would say, <clears throat> I would like to act ethically and in accordance with my values as long as it doesn't put me at a systematic disadvantage. Now that's not the same as saying as I know I'll succeed. It's not the same as saying as, uh, as long as I know I'll never pay a price. It simply means I think I have a shot. I think I have a chance. And so what we're trying to do with this approach is actually, I, I don't think I have the power to change the opportunists. They'll always be with us. And I'm not so worried about the idealists, except I wish they were more competent. But we're really focusing on the pragmatists. And we're saying, we want to give you the literal practice, the pre-scripting, the rehearsal, the action planning with your peers to normalize this conversation, to create this muscle memory um, so that you are more equipped to be who you already want to be at your best. We're not trying to change you. We're trying to empower you. And we do that through a lot of different mechanisms. And we share positive examples and negative examples and research. We identify the kinds of rationalizations that you might face and ways that you can unpack them. They're powerful, but they're usually exaggerations. And you usually can find some exceptions. And so you want to learn from those. And so that's really what uh, giving voice to values is. And I think in the kinds of examples we're talking about here, 
I heard so many things that resonated with my conversations with folks in China who were trying to deal with environmental issues when they were getting pressure around the economic impacts from the central government or some of the entrepreneurs I worked with in India who were trying to figure out a way to take a company that they had purchased from a major multinational, a Western multinational that was hugely corrupt and to find a way to operate uh, without being engaged in, in various kinds of corrupt practices that were kind of normalized in India where they were operating. Or the people I worked with in Nigeria who were under pressure from the central government to um, dis discard their waste in the landfills that were contributing to um, environmental problems. And that was because the government owned the landfill and made that legally what you were required to do. But the corporate headquarters <laughs> in, in Europe were saying you can no longer dump waste in the landfills. And so the employees were squeezed in between and were saying, you know, when we sign contractors to pick up our waste, should we tell them to lie, you know, or should we tell them to disobey the local laws? So those were the kinds of challenges that we worked with effectively. Yeah. Okay, excellent. We're going to turn to some questions from the audience now, and so I'll throw them out. And, and uh, you know, this is a grab bag. Anybody can uh, w weigh in. But the first is uh, the following. Tax havens pay, uh, play a key role in money laundering. What are the latest sanction developments, initiatives, and global movement on tax havens to improve that particular situation? In other words, the tax havens are the ones that are, are helping this, this, this along. Michelle, uh, you know, any view on that? You know, is there yes. something being done about the tax havens themselves? Yes, uh, from our experience, there are uh, different regulations around the world. Uh, we refer to European uh, regulation about the tax haven uh, that are already in place uh, and is a very in, important regulation. It's similar to the other regulation, I mean, uh, around the world, uh, different uh, region are specific regulation. We would like to to apply, it's not easy to say that it must be the government that apply this regulation. Uh, the company that are in the legal, legal world, uh, can declare this kind of uh, specific uh, shell company in order to stop this kind of phenomenon, you know. Um, but let me say, probably the, the next step will be to um, to have a one uh, regulation around the world, for example, from US to Europe to India, etc., in order to have very specific best practice about these uh, these topics. But, Carl, any view uh, by yourself on that one? Yeah, I think that uh, that the, let's say the leading governments, let's say the G7 or G20, they really don't want to do it. And the reason why I think so is uh, if one famous case in Europe was the Panama Papers. So if you think about Panama Papers and what happened around, so not, not only, let's say, the people they had the shell companies, so also to think about what happened in Panama. So there is an industry behind. There are people earning money with the money from abroad. They're bringing money there. There are lawyers, there are secretaries, there are clerks, whatever institutions they are, they are caring about. They are offering good service and other people come. So it's an import business. So uh, the question is, when I take away this kind of business, then I have to, let's say, to offer some revenge, to give something back. and. As long as I'm, as, as the big industry states, uh, not prepared, let's say, to transfer economy to these countries as well, as long they will try to make some money, however they do it. And this is, let's say, shell companies, tax avoidance. This is one kind of industry and it's one kind of business. Right. And yeah, they I understand. The market and they, they, try, they do it like this. Yeah. I think I would turn the question around a little bit just to say that I, I think that, uh, you know, again, getting to Dr. Gentile's point, uh, being a pragmatist, I think that, you know, the tax havens aren't going to change. Uh, they're going to be out there. I think they're going to move. You know, once we, you know, you close down one and again, it's whack-a-mole, you, you know, it goes someplace else. 
But from that standpoint, I think most of the focus is defense. You know, you're playing defense as opposed to offense. You're trying to prevent and identify where those are. And as they move, get ahead of that and make your defenses against flows from these companies uh, better. And also make sure that you know that you've got to do more when money is coming from you know, country A or country B that is a tax haven than you would uh, necessarily if, if it was coming from a country that you trusted more. And so I think uh, at least I see a lot of clients focusing on uh, the opposite, which is not, not thinking that the, uh, the tax havens are going to get better, but rather where are the tax havens and, and how much do I have to know about them? And as that is changing, the new ones and focusing on doing more about the fund flows that are coming from those locations because they're higher risk than the ones that are coming from other locations. So kind of an interesting way to turn it around, but at least that's what I'm seeing in practice. Next question is uh, the following, which is, should banks be held accountable for irregular money transactions to the presumable shell companies? <laughs> Carl, what's your view on that one? I think I know, but uh, based on our conversation today, but... Uh... <laughs> I think that they are already responsible for that. Yeah, I was going to say Dance Bank has certainly found out that they're somewhat, you know, <laughs> somewhat accountable and somewhat responsible. So I think the answer is uh, to, to the question is uh, that perhaps they could be more, you know, accountable and more responsible. But a lot of them are finding that that there is a high cost to this. And you know, look at some of the settlements that a lot of the institutions have made with varying jurisdictions, whether they be European, North American, or otherwise, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent in terms of that. And also the, the kind of the other cost is the remediation cost. You know, these, these companies have to fix their prior processes. And many times the remediation cost is, you know, in excess of the fine they have to pay, even though the fine is, is completely, you know, uh, ridiculous in terms of uh, how high it is. Uh, not that, not that it, it shouldn't be high, but I'm just saying that even though the, the fine is very, very high, they still have to pay even more in remediation costs. And so, you know, uh, from that standpoint, I do think the banks get held accountable. Probably they could be held more accountable, uh, perhaps, but certainly, at least in my experience, they're, they're, they don't get away uh, scot-free, shall we say. Next question um, is uh, as follows, and that's, how effective is a proper management program in an organization when it comes to stopping acts of money laundering and bribery? What's the most effective way to ensure AML compliance? Really two questions in one, but let's go to the first one. Uh, you know, how effective are current programs and uh, you know, from, from at least the perspective, and, and Ralph, I'll go to you first. How effective do you think they are? And you know, how do you think that they could become more effective? Um, I, think, I think we have a mixed picture and, and, and really uh, some of the financial institutions are pretty far down the road on, on having a very effective program. Um, there will, of course, be loops in, in, in all of these, and, and basically that's because there's also a cost to, uh, to setting up an effective program. Uh, staying on top of it, we are constantly a step behind. So it's also about playing defense in the sense of where will the risk uh, evolve and, and where can we uh, play some controls, change our approach to it to, to get those bases covered. Um, then, of course, we have, um, if you look into the fintech, some of these areas might not be as mature. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them definitely need to, to pick up on, on that uh, in that area. Um, and then we can step further out on, on all those that are need to to report and and be uh, be included in in, in the AML um, laws uh, in the sense of who should be have an AML program. And uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that in, in some of the uh, sectors or industries um, that also need to do this, um, they have a long way to go. Um, and uh, Probably we're going to see that when the financial institutions get better and better, um, where will the uh, money flow? They will flow to somewhere where it's much easier to get through. So uh, sorry right, to exactly. say, 
back, back to Carl's comment about are we winning? No, we are playing yeah. defense and you'll be one step behind. Exactly. And, and the whole challenge of you know cryptocurrencies, which we're not going to cover obviously in this session, which is the disintermediation issue and and you know will people who are doing these nefarious acts even use banks and financial institutions in the future or will they just go to crypto uh you know kind of locations and uh you know basically go around the banking system altogether so you could have the greatest defense in the world but if the bank isn't used as the flow or in the flow then it's it's kind of hard to uh you know uh stop it if if it becomes a totally a crypto situation so quite interesting there there are other questions but we have run out of time so i'd like to uh, thank my panelists, my fellow panelists. They've done, they've done a wonderful job. Thank you very much. And of course, most of all, thank you to the, the, the people who have watched in the audience. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions that had been posed, but we'll try to you know, you get back to you by email or something like that. And appreciate your time and effort today. And thank you very much. And we hope you have a good rest of your day, evening, or morning, however, you know, wherever in the world you are. And uh, have a good day. Take care. Everybody.